All right, guys, welcome to this last class of uh, basic Python programming. Uh, I hope you all had a good week. Um, so yeah, let's let's wrap this up. Um, let me start sharing my screen. So we had homework from last class. Uh, I'd like to, I'd like to go over both of them. Um, okay. So here for the first homework, we have a, a list called nums. The first thing we had to do was convert the list of strings. No, convert the string into a list of strings. That was first. Um, and then second, we convert the list of strings into a list of numbers. And then you print out the numbers, the list of numbers. And then you find the max and min of the, of, of the list of numbers, and then sort in decreasing in descending order. And then finally, you compare nums with nums2, like another list of numbers. So, so yeah, it's kind of a lot. So let's go over how to do this. Um, Right, I have the solution somewhere. Okay, here it is. Here's the solution. Um, so in my code here, I've uh, I have my list of, of not, I have my string of numbers here. It's pretty long. My string of numbers. So the first thing I do, I had to do, was turn this string of numbers into a, a list of a list of numbers that are strings. So that's what this line here does, line four. I make another variable called nums underscore str. That's equals to that's equals to uh, nums dot split, and then I split it based on the based on a comma. All right. So the result of that is going to be. I'll just comment everything out. So the results of doing this split function is going to be a list of a list of numbers that are strings, as you guys can see here. So the result of doing nums.split with a comma gives me this list of numbers, but they're not integers. They're just they're just uh they're just strings still. That's why there's these quotes here. So for the second part of the homework, we had to um, we had to turn this list of this list of strings here into a list of numbers, and that's precisely what this line right here does. So I make a variable called nums underscore int, and I make it equal to a map. Well, I, I map so I use the map function to to um to to I use the map function to apply the int uh, function to this list of strings here, and then I convert that whole thing to a list. Um, so if I were to print this, we have our list of numbers here. We converted our list of strings here into a list of numbers with this map function map. Parentheses int comma num string, which is a list of strings. Uh, so, any questions so far about what I've done with the homework solution? I'll make sure to post this on the Google Classroom as well, so you guys have reference to this. Uh, okay. So. Now that we have our list of our list of numbers, we have to find the max and min of this list of numbers. So that one was pretty straightforward. I just uh, whoops. I just apply the max function and the min function, which are both built in Python functions, to my list of numbers, and I of course make them new variables and stuff. So the result of running this, we get our max number, which is 93,459, and our min is five. 
Okay, so I just use the max and min to find those values. And then next, we have to sort our list of numbers in descending order. Um, so I do that with the sort method. So I do nums underscore int, which is my list of, of numbers that are integers. And then I call the sort function on that. And then I make sure to, to set reverse equal to true so that it's done in, in descending order. So if I run this, we have our sorted list down here. So yeah, 93,459 is in the first. And we see five at the back over here. Um, so yeah. And finally, we have, I, I copied nums two from the homework prompts. Um, so it's a list of numbers that's down here. And I make a Boolean expression to compare the lengths of nums ints, which is my sorted, which is my list of, of, of numbers and nums two. And this is a Boolean expression that I that I did. I did I'm comparing the length of nums two to the length of nums ints. And I'm printing the result of that, which should be true or false. Sorting this gives me true, which means that the length of nums2 is greater than or equal to the length of nums ints, which is my list of numbers. And that's the homework. Um, any questions about this homework solution? All right. I'm going to post this quickly. All right, posted. Okay, uh, now let's move on to the optional homework. Uh, so for the optional homework, I have a list of cars. That's really a list of dictionaries. Uh, so we really have a list of dictionaries. Um, that's what we're starting with. And our objective is to sort the list according to the brand name's length in descending order and print out the list. And then after we do that, we sort the list by year in ascending order and then print it out. Um, so the solution to that is right here. And we'll go over this. So in this block right here, from lines one to eight, I have my list of, of, of cars um, and their dictionaries. With, with two keys, brand and year. Um, so first we have to sort my list of cars. For to sort this, I use the sorted method, um, which is the Python built-in function. So to so the sorted method, I pass cars, I pass into it the cars um, list. And then for the key, so this is kind of complicated. I had to use a Lambda function, which I'm not too sure if I've gone over yet. But what this stretch of code does here is that um, I'm like finding the length of each of the, I'm finding the length of each of the values of the brand car values. So I'm finding the length of Dodge, Ford, Toyota, Mitsubishi, um, and the rest of them. I'm finding the length of them, um, and then I'm sorting it with the sorted method. Then after I do that, I do this thing right here. So I have a question for you guys. What does what does this this thing that I have tacked on to the end of this line mean? This 
colon, colon, negative one. What is that doing to my sorted list? Right? It's reversing it. It's, re it's reversing my list. Uh, good job, Ivan. Yep. Um, and to sort the, the my list of dictionaries by year, it's pretty similar. I just do the same thing, except I just replace um, this Len D brand with just D year. And I, I don't have to find the length of it this time because the year is already in numbers. So I'm just finding, I'm just sorting my list of dictionaries by year. Um, which is already an integer, which is fine. And then just print up both lists. Um, so yeah, the, the, the trickiest part of this homework is, is the Lambda stuff. Um, but yeah, any questions about this assignment? All right, uh, let me post the solution to this as well. All right. Well, those are the homework assignments. Now let's get back to um, the lectures from class, the lecture slides from class seven. Uh, we weren't able to finish all of them. Uh, this is the last class, so we'll just see how far we can get. Uh, so, with with the lecture with with the lecture seven slides, we talked a little bit about setting up the Python IDE, which, which we have already done, but we'll just skip that. We talked about user input a little bit from last class, um, how to take user input. Uh, we talked about typecasting. Uh, and we talked a little bit about code blocks, how to organize the blocks of code. And that's about where we stopped, I think. Uh, let me see my insert, let me see my code again. Okay. Yep, yep, today's the last class. Um, so this is about where, where we left off with if statements, how to do if statements. So let's just continue on. Uh, so this slide right here just gives some more examples of if statements, um, or at least the syntax for them. So for this first slide, we have uh, if manager is, is equal to Tom and money does not equal 50. A uh, second line is if my fave if my fave in app, uh, so that's this first line is just just comparing um, manager to, to a string and money to a, an integer. Pretty straightforward. The second line, if my fave is if my fave in apple pear, what this is doing is that it's like checking to see if my fave, whatever like that variable is, if that is in this list. So doing the, this kind of syntax is pretty. Um, common in Python if you want to check if a certain variable is in the list. Um, yeah. And this third line, if X is Y, yeah, that's just checking if two variables is equal to each other. Um, it's It works similarly, or really it works exactly the same way as um, equals equals. So this third line could be rewritten as if X equal equal Y. Um, but so, but having in the syntax of X is Y is also done, can also be done as well. Um, and then this fourth line, if X is not false, that's just, well, in this case, X is a Boolean variable. So that can be either true or false. So you're checking to see if X is 
true rather really so this this fourth line is the same thing as saying if x is true um but saying if x is not false also is sometimes done so yeah those are just some examples of conditional statements so um if a condition is if a condition is satisfied the following block of x the following block of code will be executed the rest of the code blocks will be ignored. So it is good practice to make the condition checks mutually exclusive. So this is something that we've come across um, in our code for that if one block is satisfied, if a condition is satisfied, then only that block is carried out and then the rest of the block is, and then the rest of the blocks are ignored. Um, so we can like try it out again here. So let me just run this piece of code again. So I'm inputting a number, I'm gonna input 100, and then it just says positive number, so which is exactly what we thought, because 100 is greater than zero, but 100 greater than zero is true, so it just prints out print positive number, and then it ignores all the other blocks because we already found a true statement. Does that make sense? How if one part of, uh, of a if statement is true, everything else is ignored? All right. Let's see next. So this slide kind of gives a more general explanation on the form of a conditional statement or in this statement. So if statement is true, do something else. If another statement is true, do something else. I'll if another statement is true, do something else. And you could have you could have as many L ifs as you want or else ifs. Um, and then if none of the if or else if statements are true, then you have this else block at the end. That's that does another thing. Um, so our example code also follows the structure. We have an if, we have an L if, and if neither of these are true, then we have an else. And we could we could have as many elifs as we want, um, but as the slide mentioned, it's best to have it be mutually exclusive. And by mutually exclusive, that means um, that how can I explain mutual exclusion? It, it means that each blocks, each of the code blocks, um, don't they don't have overlapping uh, cases. That that's what it means. So these two code blocks are mutually exclusive because the number can't be greater than zero and also less than zero. That's what we mean by mutual exclusion. Okay. Uh, you can have as many elifs as needed, but you can all have, but you could have only one if and one else in the same conditional block. Uh, so yep. Yeah, so you could have. As many elifs as, as many elifs as you want, but only one if and only one else in an if else statement. So in the simplest form of, of an if statement, you could just have if statement is true, do something, and then that's it. That's as simple as it can be. Um, and this slide kind of highlights that simplicity. We have an ins we have a, a variable x and a variable y. And then we check if x is greater than y, then we print out something. And then that's it. We don't have any else ifs. We don't have any else blocks. We only have the if block. Uh, so I'll just post this in our interpreter so that we have that. Not interpreter. I'll post this on our, in our IDE. So yeah, it runs as we expect it. We only have one, even though we only have one block, if X is greater than Y, then print out something. All right. 
uh, you can nest you can nest a conditional block into another condition block. So the nested condition block must be complete in the parent block, must be completely in the parent block. It cannot cross two blocks in the parent level. Um, so yep, you, you can have nested if statements in Python. And I'll go over that in practice. Uh, so for this code, we have um, an int x. Oh, not an int x. We have x and y that takes user input. So x is an integer and y is another integer. And then we have if x is greater than y and y is greater, sorry. And then we have if x is greater than zero and y is greater than zero, then we print something. And then we have this nested if statement here. We have this nested if statement that says if x is greater than y, then do something else. Else we do something else. <laughs> and then we also have this other at the, then we have this other else block. So this might seem kind of confusing, uh, nested if statements. So we're gonna practice this a little bit. Um so let me run this. If I were to say so x. Well, let's say that my x is nine and my y is 100. If I were to run this code, what will be printed? What do you guys think will be printed? Um, all positive and y is larger, right? Um. So you were right about the first part, all positive. Um, but what will be printed out after that is x is not larger than y because x is 9 and y is 100. Uh, so let's go through this code uh, step by step. So we have all positive and x is not larger than y. Uh, so when we get to this if statement here, is that true? Or is with x is 9 and y is 100, is this? Is this if statement true or false? Is this is this line here true or false? It's true. Okay. Yep, it's true. And since it's true, we go down here with print all positive. If this was false, if line 38 was false, we would have went straight to this else statement down here. And I'll show you guys. So if I were to say x was negative 100 and y is negative 3, then we'll just go straight to not positive because both x and y are less than, because, because x and y aren't greater than 0. They both need to be greater than 0, or else we'll just go down to this else block right here. OK? But let's keep them at 9 and 100. Um, so since, so, so now that we're in, inside the if statement, like down here, we're going to check if X is greater than Y. Um, and since that's false, since X is greater than Y is false, we go to the else right here, the else in line 42, and then we print out X is not larger than Y. So that is how the flow of this program works. Uh, let's see if there are any more nested if statements. No, okay. Uh, are there any questions about nested if statements? All right, let's move on. Uh, so we have an exercise. Try another example. Ask the user to input two values, then print out the difference if the first one is larger, print out their addition if the first one is smaller, and print out equal if they're true. Um, 
So let's go through this exercise together. Okay, so we have our two inputs, X and Y, that we take as user input. Oh, whoops. So the first thing we need to do is uh, print out the difference if the first one is larger. So I'm going to ask you guys what that will look like as an if statement, where we want to print out the difference between x and y if x is greater than y. Can somebody tell me what's the code? You can either post it in the chat or just say it. Okay, so what we're going to do is that we're going to do if x is greater than y, right? If x is greater than y, then we're going to print x minus y. That's what the first part of the exercise wants us, the first part of the exercise wants us to do, right? Yeah, we print out the difference if the first one is large is larger. Um, so that means we're going to check if x is greater than y. And if and if that's true, we print out x is x minus y. So with that, we have the second part of this exercise. Print out their addition, print out their addition if the first one is smaller. Um, so that one's going to look a lot like the one for the first one. So can somebody tell me what I should code in in the in our next as our next code block? Yeah. If x is smaller than y, yeah. I'll print x plus y. Okay, so should we have if or l if? If. Oh, okay. Uh we should actually have l if here. Um because because we're doing an else if. So the first part of our code checks if x is greater than y, then print out the difference. L if x is less than y, then we then we print x plus y. Um, so yeah, we could have also had an if there. Um, but the way that Python is usually programmed, um, you, you could have two if statements back to back like that. Um, but in situations like this, it's preferable to have an else if. Um, that's why we have an else if x is less than y, then do stuff. And then finally, we have print out equal if they are equal. So how can we implement that? Prints out equal if X and Y are equal. What should I have as my last stuff here? Um, we have um, else. Yeah, else. Um, print x equals y. Yep, exactly. Good job. So let's run this code and see what we get. Uh, let's put in 6 for x and 101 for y. So with that, we get x plus y because x is less than y, which is what we expect. Now let's do x as 1,000 and y as 9. We get x minus y, which is what we expect, because now we are in this block. 
when in the previous one we were in the in the Aleph block. Um, and finally, let's make x let's make x one and y one. We print out x x is equal to y because we are in the else block, and we are in the else block because neither of the two preceding if and elif statements are true. So we went to the else block. Uh, any questions about this exercise? All right. Oops. Ah, stop. Okay. All right, let's move on. All right, so we have a quiz. Um, given the nested if else structure below, what will be the value of x after execution completes? Well, so this is, yeah, so this is quite the nested block. This, has a, this quiz will test you guys on your code flow reading ability. Um, so yeah, I'll give you guys a minute to look at this code block and try to figure out what x, what the value of x is what the value of x is printed as. Okay. Um, oh, because we got an answer. Okay, so what's going to be printed from this code block is two. So can somebody explain to me why they think it's two or why the answer should be two? Yeah, go ahead, Eddie. So like for, like, so the first part, like, like after all like the equations like if a is bigger than zero then like a actually it's not bigger than zero so we can just cancel out everything in like that like part of the code so like we just go directly to the else at the very bottom yep. so it just like says x equals x plus two so x is zero so then it's just two Yep, that's exactly right, Eddie. Very good job. And we can verify this by uh, printing out this, by actually running this code. Um, let's see. So when we run this code, we get two, just as we suspect. And we get to because of what because of what Eddie said, how since this initial if statement is not true, we go straight to the else and we ignore everything in the in the nested block. Uh, let's see, what's the next question? 
actually let's play around with this with this quiz a little bit more. So if I were to change, if I were to change A to nine, what would I end up getting then if I change A to nine? Five. Uh, and why do we get five, James? Because A is greater than zero and B is negative five, which is smaller than zero. So the first two ifs, it just works. Mm. Yep, that's exactly right. Nice job, James. So if we run this, we indeed get five. All right. Um, let's move on. So for the second quiz, we have, what is the output of the following if statement? Um, we have two variables, A and B, and we have this if statement. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Um, okay, I'll, I'll let you guys think about this one um, and post what you think the answer is. Well, I guess the hint here is that in Python, any variable that like um, any result that is not zero is pretty much true. And every, every result that is zero is false. That's how Python looks at things. Okay. Uh, so the answer is actually true because um, A plus B is 17 and 17 is not zero, which is true. Um, which Python says is true. I guess in Python, like whenever you have the existence of something, then it's true. But if you don't have the existence of something, then it's false. So like even an empty list, and Python would be false. But any list that has stuff in it would be true. One of the things that you come across. So if I were to run this code, um, we indeed get true. But if I were to change 12 to, uh, if I were to change A to negative five, and we try to run this code, we get false. And we get a false because negative five plus five is zero. And so Python zero is false. So we get false. Any questions about that quiz? All right. Uh, so there is homework for this lecture, but this is the last, since this is the last class, you guys can just do this for fun if you want. I'll still post it, but um, I'm probably not gonna, I mean, I'll still look at the answers of you guys. I mean, I'll, I'll post the solution so that you, you guys have a reference to work with. Uh, but I mean, this is the last day of class, so. But anyway, this homework is, is this homework says to ask, Ask the user to input a sentence with at least 30 letters. If the input has less than 30 letters, ask the user to input again. After you get a satisfactory input, find out the middle letter and its position. And it gives an example. Um, if you have 35 letters, the middle is the 18th one. If you have 36, the, if you have 36, then both 18th and 19th are the middle letters. 
Um, so yeah, and there seems to be a part two. Okay, so then you print out the result and then you sort the letters in the sentence in alphabetical order. So you, you're gonna use the sort method. Um, and then you're gonna find out the middle letters again and then print the result. Uh, this should all be written in one file. The process to find the middle letters should not be hard-coded. It should work no matter what sentence you put in. Uh, so this homework tests your ability to use if statements, to typecast, to take user input. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Any questions about the homework? Wait, talking about letters, the space count as one letter? Uh, no, so uh, it says uh, spaces and punctuation don't count. Good question, James. Okay. So with that, let's move on to the last lecture slide. Okay. Um, so as a little bit of review, um, how do you get user input in Python? What do you use? What function do you use? to get user input. We use the input function to get user input in Python. Just like we have in this code, right? Somewhere over here. Yep, right here, we use input to the, the input function to take user input. Um, secondly, how many L ifs can you have in a condition block? Can somebody answer infinite, that? Infinite. Yep, infinite. Good job, James. Uh, okay. So the, um, so for our last time here, I'll give a quick introduction to loops in Python. Um, so just so I know, um, does anyone here have any experience with loops in general, whether they be in Python or Java or whatever? Okay, so we're going into uncharted territory here. Okay, so a loop. Uh, a loop is used to execute a block of code multiple times. And it has two forms, a for loop and a while loop. So in a for loop, mm. this is an example of a for loop. We have, we have, say we have a list of fruits, and then this is the syntax to iterate through this list of, of fruits. We have four X and fruits print X. So if we were to um, if we were to put this in our code, um, so for X and fruits, so what this block, what, what this line here means is that for, which is how we do loops, for x, which is just a placeholder variable, and then we do in fruits, and fruits is the list. So we're just iterating through, we're just iterating through um, our list of fruits here. Any questions about this? about what this code block does. Wait, can you like change X to Y? Does that also work? Yeah, we could change X to gibberish. 
<laughs> if we want. Oh my gosh, let's I'm gonna put a good yeah. Let's just put gibberish. Okay, good. And if we run this, it works as a, oh no. Whoops. Okay. <laughs> well, one little thing. I have to if I put gibberish, then I have to make sure that the print statement is also gibberish. But we could just do something like this for gibberish and fruits, then print out whatever our placeholder is. And then the code will still work. So yeah, that, that's a good question. Yep, it's the X, the X in this code block um, is only a placeholder. It's a placeholder variable. Okay. Another example for X and bamboo print X. So for loops actually also works on strings um, as we as we as we will see here. Um, so we have for X and bamboo print X. So if we were to run this, we get each individual letter in the in the string bamboo. Okay. And we also have for x in range 10, print x. So it, this is, it's been a minute since we've seen the range syntax. Um, So can somebody remind me what range means, what range 10 means? All right. Does that give you numbers start from zero? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It goes from zero to nine. So when we do for x in range 10 print x, it'll just give us the numbers from zero to nine because range 10 is just the numbers from zero to nine. Okay. And we can get even more creative with our um, with our for loops. So in this code block, we have a list of words. Um, and then we do for W in words, we print out the placeholder variable W and also the length of the word W. So if I were to put this in our code, we'll get cat three, window six and Deppen street 12 because we're iterating through each of the words in our list of words here. And then we print out W and the length of W. All right, that's how it works. Any questions about this loop, about this for loop? Okay. Um, we could also loop through a range. So this code block is an, is an interesting example of, of range. So we have a list A of some words, and then we do for I in range, and then the length of A. Um, we print out our placeholder variable I, and also A sub I. Um, so I'll let you guys think about this one for a minute. Let me just put this in my in my, code, in my IDE real quick. Um, so can somebody tell me what range len A is going to be? Like what, what number should be substituted, not should be, but what does range len A actually mean? 
Like what number is it going to be? All right, I'm just guessing it's from like zero to four. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because because the length of A is zero is, is one, one, two, two. three, four, five. Yeah. Um, and range does zero to the last one that you're putting in, which is five in this case, minus one, so four. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So if I were to run this, we have zero to four. Yeah. And this A sub I, what this is doing is that it's printing out like each each element in the list. So when A is zero, we're printing out A, A bracket zero, which is Mary. When A is one, we're printing out A bracket one, which is had, and then so on. So yeah, this is an interesting use of a for loop. Um, so list is used in loop and list is used in the loop so the code can process each and every item in the list. So pay attention to the code block and in keywords, let's review our list comprehension. So yeah, you guys will probably recognize the four keyword from our list comprehension lesson from a while back. Uh, it's the same exact thing. List comprehensions also use for loops implicitly. So let's do a real world, a real world problem. We have a list of numbers. If we do not use the built-in function min, how can we find the minimum value of the list? Does the next slide get the answer? Yes, it does. Okay. All right. So how can we find the minimum value of this list of numbers here without using the built-in function min? So it looks like this code block here, this next slide, shows us how to do that. So let's copy this over to our IDE and see what this is about. Okay. So first we declare our list of numbers in X. So X is equal to some numbers. And then we say the least is equal to X sub zero, which is 45. Um, and then, and then we iterate through X, okay, which is a list of numbers. So this example is actually combining both for loops and if statements. Um, so in this block, we iterate through X and then we check if our current N, our placeholder variable N, we're checking if that's less than the least. And if it is less than the least, then we update the value of the least variable. Um, and then after we do this, we should get the value of, of least, which is 12. Any questions about this code block, about this for loop? Jeez, my cat is losing his mind in my room right now. The class is almost over, buddy. Okay. Next, um, you can also nest the loop in a loop. So say that we have a list, 45, whatever. We can, we can how can we sort this list ascending without using the built-in function? Um, Hmm. We can do it with the nested for loop. So let me just copy this over and play with this and play around with this over a little bit. So here we have a regular for loop that's not nested. And then next we're gonna have now this is gonna be a big file. <laughs> next we have this nested for loop. So in this nested for loop, we have four i in range len x, 
So we recognize the syntax range len x. And then we, under that for loop, we have another for loop for j in range i plus one to len x. So that's pretty much iterating um, from where we're currently at to everything to the end. We check if our current, the, our current, I guess, number that we're on for the first loop is greater than whatever we're currently on in the second loop. And if they are, then we switch their places. So this is one example of sorting a list. So if we do this, this is our answer. This is our sorted list. Um, so actually this, this, this cold block is actually a very well-known algorithm. This is called, uh, I think it's called selection sort. It's either called selection sort or bubble sort. Um, but this is a very simple way of sorting a list. And it uses two for loops to do it. Um, so yeah, it might be kind of advanced for you guys to completely grasp now, but um, just know that this is an example of doing a nested for loop. So the way that the code flow is, is, is that we start with 45 and then we iterate through everything after it. So that's going to be like this first iteration of the loop. And then after that, we go to 23 and then check everything after that. And then we go to 76 and then check everything after 76 and then so on. That's how this for loop is working. Okay, I think I have time for one more slide. Um, this one's hard, okay. Uh, what is the output of the following for loop and range function? Uh, so we have for num and range, negative two, negative five, and negative one, and then print num and equal. Let's just put this in our IDE and see, because even I don't know what the answer to this is. <laughs> Okay, so for num and range, negative two, negative five, negative one. So what this is doing, I think, is that we start at negative two and then we go up to negative five, but we're doing this backwards. So this does negative five, negative four, negative three, or something like that. Okay, so we're skipping negative five, which is okay. Um, so we do negative four, negative three, negative two. So we're kind of iterating from negative five to negative two backwards. And we skip negative five because we always skip the last thing that we're on. Um, so this answer corresponds to D. All right, there's more stuff, but we won't have time to do that today. Um, I think I'll just about stop my lesson here. It's about 7.30 now. Uh, well, thank you guys so much for taking part in this Intro to Python programming class. I appreciate you guys being good students. I hope you guys learned a lot. And uh, yeah, um, I hope you guys um, consider taking the advanced Python class where we'll do some more work on loops, I imagine, and also work with classes, like like Python classes and object-oriented programming. Uh, and yeah, that's about it. Any questions about what you guys have seen so far today? Or what you guys have seen today? Okay.